Hello, and welcome to Insider Insights. I'm Anne Meisinger, Assistant Educator in Public Programs and Creative Practice. While the museum is temporarily closed, we're providing close looks at objects from the Met Collection and exhibitions with museum experts. We hope you'll join us as we debut a new program in the series each week. Today, we're joined by my colleague, Sean Belair, Assistant Conservator in the Department of Arms and Armor, who is going to be sharing more about the treatment he did on an Islamic male shirt. We'll be taking a deeper dive into the technical aspects of the work he did on this object and the process of conserving a piece of armor made up of 12,000 inscribed rings. Sean, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, and thank you for letting me participate in Insider Insights. Arms and Armor Conservation is an embedded conservation section. While many conservation sections, such as paintings conservation and textile conservation, work in the collections of several curatorial departments, we are completely dedicated to the care and preservation of arms and armor. At over 100 years old, we are one of the oldest conservation sections in the museum. Our first armorer, Daniel Teschel, seen here on the left, was, a, was an armorer working in France, and the department's first curator convinced Teschel to immigrate to the United States. The department has, has had dedicated armorers ever since. Currently, Arms and Armor Conservation consists of armorer, conservator, Edward Hunter, and myself. We are also joined by our current conservation fellow, Katrina Zacharias. I'll be speaking with you about the treatment of this male shirt. The shirt was probably made in Iran in the 15th or 16th century. It is made of iron rings with a decorative border of brass rings around the sleeves, hem, and abdomen. Each ring bears an Arabic inscription. The inscription contains the names of Allah and the Alobay, that is Muhammad, his daughter Fatima, Muhammad's cousin and Fatima's husband Ali, and their sons Hassan and Hussein. Mail is a flexible fabric made from interlocking metal rings. The exact origin of mail is uncertain, but it appears to have been invented in Central Asia in the 5th century BC. Mail was adopted by the Celts, and from them the Romans, and eventually spread through North Africa and Asia. There's a great variety in the design and construction of mail, but the basic pattern is uh, called a four in one. Basically, each ring, through each ring, passes four others. The resulting pattern looks like a series of alternating rows. A row of rings may be added or removed to fit the contours of the body. This means that in some places, like the inside of the armpit, or in a line running down the leg or the arm, there may be only three rings in one or five rings in one to allow the garment to taper. There are a couple different methods for making male rings. This shirt is made entirely of riveted rings. Riveted rings are made with the ends of wire overlapping. This overlap is then hammered flat and a hole is pierced or punched through. And then the two ends are riveted together, sealing the ring. In this shirt, and indeed in most mail from across Asia, the hole is circular and takes a cylindrical rivet. The pliers used to crimp the rivets closed had a concave depression in the jaws, you know, crushing the ends of the rivet into these dome shapes so that it looked uh, not unlike a dumbbell in cross section. The shirt suffered from extensive small losses, most con mostly consisting of only one or two rings a hole. There was also a large loss around the back of the neck. This image of the shirt stretched over a piece of white foam gives a good impression of the extent of the losses. Additionally, there were a large number of rings which were still attached to the shirt but had lost their rivets. Several of these had caught on other parts of the shirt and become entangled. On several of the surviving rings, the rivets were bent over instead of being compressed into these dome shapes. Many of these rivets were loose, being nothing more than bent wire. This tells us that the depression in the jaws were larger than needed, giving the rivet room to bend over instead of properly compressing. It appears the oversized riveting tongs are responsible for the high number of losses, and as a result, the number of missing rings. The bent over rivets would fall out or otherwise become dislodged, leaving the now unriveted rings susceptible to entanglement. Now I should point out there's no indication whatsoever that any of these losses were caused by a weapon during the shirt's working life. When the shirt came to us, it was thickly covered in old coatings and grime. Additionally, there were bits of excelsior or sawdust lodged in between some of the overlaps, probably an old packing material. The surface of the iron rings are deeply pitted and worn. The raised areas are burnished, but the recesses are dull metal without any trace of corrosion. The condition indicates the shirt was corroded heavily in the past and then been acid cleaned, the burnish caused by the rings rubbing against each other. 
The question is, to why would we conserve a mail shirt? Well, the interlocking rings of mail create a mutually supportive fabric that spreads the weight of the garment across the rings. When a ring is broken, the weight of the garment is no longer evenly distributed. This puts adjacent rings at risk of breaking as well. It's common to find bent or broken rings around a loss. In addition to the structural concerns, the curators felt that the shirt was not displayable in its current condition. The minor, loss, the minor losses would distract the viewer, and the large loss around the neck would affect the overall hang of the garment. The insertion of replacement rings spreads the weight of the garment out evenly, reducing the strain on the surviving rings. The replacement rings also pull the garment back to the proper position. You can see here in these before and after images of the cuff of a 15th century German shirt, how the addition of just a few rings can radically improve the appearance and readability of a piece. Here in red, you can see where rings were added to fill out the cuff. In most cases, when restoring mail, basic round or flattened wire can be inserted without disrupting the appearance of the piece. With this shirt, it was found that plain, uninscribed rings inserted into the fabric caught the eye and distracted from the rest of the object. A number of, a number of treatment options were considered, including the use of non-ferrous metals, 3D printed inert plastic, and a number of alternate inscriptions. Uh, which may have made the, the replacement rings more readable and identifiable to the viewer. But it was eventually decided that iron rings stamped with the inscription would be the least distracting to the viewer and the most respectful to the intrinsic religious nature of the shirt. It was decided that striking rings using the historic method would not only be the most time and cost effective, but provide us with an invaluable opportunity to learn more about the manufacture of inscribed rings. There was a concern that a non-Muslim craft, crafting an Islamic inscription might be considered inappropriate, especially considered the, considering the fire and force necessary to stamp iron rings. We consulted with Muslim colleagues, and the response we received is that there was nothing inherently offensive about a non-Muslim recreating the inscription, so long as we did not alter the inscription. It's important to ensure that replacement rings could be identified and that the treatment was properly documented. In addition to before and after photographs and textual documentation, each ring would be marked with a small MMA stamp, so they can be easily, easily identified as replacements on examination. Under normal circumstances, the rings would be marked on the exterior so that the viewer would be able to identify the replacements from the original material while the object was on display. But because of the presence of the religious inscription on the, on the exterior and the instructions we were given not to alter the inscription, we decided to mark the interior of the rings instead. While the insertion of new rings might appear like a highly invasive restoration, it is completely reversible and does not in any way alter original material. To further facilitate the identification and reversibility of the treatment, it was decided to not rivet most of the replacement rings, but instead leave them budded. The only place where, budded ring, or where riveted rings would be used is in the large loss around the back of the neck, where there would be some structural concern. However, the patch, patch of riveted rings would be attached to the original rings by a row of butted rings. This way, the butted rings could be twisted open and the whole patch of riveted rings removed without needing to employ clippers. First, the shirt had to be cleaned. The shirt was repeatedly soaked and scrubbed in solvent baths. This photo is of the solvent bath after the first soak. The accumulated grime turned the solvents completely black. An artist's eraser was used to brighten up the brass rim slightly. Other methods, such as using calcium carbonate or bronze wool, were tested, but the bright flint finish of the cleaned rings clashed with the patina of the iron rings. The entire uh, shirt was coated with wax and then buffed to protect it from moisture. The raised inscription on the rings would have been imparted by stamping it in a, a, a die, like hand-struck coins. Coins from this period are made in a two-die system. The bottom die, which was sunk into a bench, is called the anvil die, and is traditionally engraved with the heads. A coin blank is placed on top of the anvil die, and an upper die, called a hammer die, is placed on top and struck with a hammer. The prototype die was constructed, and experimentation began. On the right, you can see some of the dozens of rings that were made during testing. The tests achieved their best results using the prototype as an anvil die with a matched hammer die, rather than as an anvil die struck directly with a hammer or as a loose hammer die struck over a flat anvil. There are some misstrikes in the rings that give us an indication as to the shape of the die itself. There were several rings with a flattened lip around the inside of the ring, seen here picked out in red. This misstrike tells us that the inscription was sunk into a channel in the die, 
and the flare is caused by the rear overlap of the wire being misaligned and crushed against the raised center of the die. Having a shallow channel sunk into the die would help hold the ring in place during striking. Based off what was learned from the prototype die and from discussions with conservator Edward Hunter and Miroslav Maskiewicz of the MS MMA's machine shop, it was decided to construct a large anvil die with a stem on the bottom that would socket directly into the bench. Originally, a positive inscription would have been carved into a punch. The die would have been heated up in a forge and the punch would have been used to stamp a negative inscription into the die. Rather than, rather than do this, uh, we decided to etch the inscription into the die and then clean it up and sharpen it with the engraving and chasing. It was felt that this method would most accurately retain the hand of the original artist. A channel corresponding to the size of the rings was carved out using a rotary tool and abrasive papers. This served the dual function of holding the ring in place while stamping and imparting a flattened D-shaped cross section. A photo was taken of the most complete ring that could be found and safely extracted from the shirt. The photo was then put into Photoshop and reduced to a black and white inscription. A mirror version of the inscription was then printed out to scale. The die was then coated with a resist and the inscription was adhered into the channel. Under a microscope, the letters were then cut away with a scalpel. Once the letters had been removed, a needle was used to scrape the letters into the resist. The dye was then suspended in a solution of nitric acid. The acid was repeatedly agitated to remove bubbles and knock away waste material. It took two rounds of coating and etching for the inscription to reach the desired depth. After etching, gravers and chasing tools were used to clean up the inscription. Here's a shot of uh, using uh, Play-Doh to test to the depth of the inscription as I worked. Once the die was inscribed, it was heat treated in, uh, to harden the metal. Wire, wire was coiled using a mandrel and clipped into rings. The rings were placed in the anvil die and a hammer die made from a hex bolt were placed on top. The hammer die was then struck with a sledgehammer. Once the ring was struck, it was left in the die and given the MMA mark. The mark had to be applied while the ring was still inside the die, since doing it on a flat surface would have deformed the inscription. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the original ring and one of the replacement rings. The replacement rings were given a 10-minute soak in 5% nitric acid to etch the surface, both to blend it in with the etched and worn surface of the original rings and to make it easier for pigments to adhere to the surface. As some sections of the rings were more corroded and worn than others, some batches were etched a little longer than others. The rings were then warmed up with a heat gun and a light wash of pigmented wax applied over the surface. Butted rings were inserted into the shirt and closed with pliers. The riveted rings were inserted around the neck and sealed using a pair of riveting pliers with concave depressions in the jaws. Here's a before and after of the neck. A total of 249 rings were inserted into the shirt. As the shirt is made up of over 12,000 rings, this means that after treatment, the shirt is still around 98% original material. The shirt is currently on display in the Arms and Armor Galleries in a small display of Islamic mail. We hope you will come, come see it in the museum when it reopens. Thank you for watching Insider Insights.